Uh, <coughs> welcome everyone to the uh, Institute for Experiential AI, <coughs> our last in the series of seminars for the fall uh, in is the experience. Uh, <coughs> um, Expeditions in Experiential AI. <laughs> Always. Uh, the Expedition series is intended for our own faculty at Northeastern uh, to present the exciting stuff they're working on. And in parallel to this, every other week, we run our distinguished lecture series, which is designed for external speakers coming to Northeastern. Uh, today, we're kind of doubly lucky because we uh, have a very interesting topic, and we are doing it also live. Uh, and we, we, if you are on the Boston campus and you're not in this room, shame on you. You should just walk down to Perry Student Center and join us. Um, but it's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce uh, a colleague of mine from the Curie College of Computer Science, uh, Professor Saif Savage who uh, I will let her introduce her background uh, herself as part of her talk. But uh, to me, the highlights are she has experienced industry, research in industry, and working at companies. She has experienced working at at least a couple of universities, uh, did her PhD at uh, UC Santa Barbara uh, with an advisor that I know. <laughs> and uh, a lot of companies talk about AI for good. Uh, I was very pleased to see that somebody is actually thinking about this more formally and saying, well, what does this mean? What are the quandaries here? How should we think about it systematically and, and how to do this right? So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Saif, and welcome. Thank you for being our speaker. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone uh, who came uh, to, to my talk. It's uh, really uh, great to meet you all. Um, and thank you very much for this invitation. Um, and congratulations on everything that the Institute is doing. It's uh, really nice to see how you're democratizing who can understand AI and also become an innovator in this space. So today I'm going to be presenting about designing AI for social good. Um, as was mentioned, I'm currently an assistant professor at the Cory College of Computer Sciences, uh, where I funded my research lab called the Northeastern Civic AI Lab. And let's start. Oh, oh okay. So when we start to think about AI for... Oh, okay. That'll be a perfect, great, great idea. So. When you start to think about AI for social good, some of the things to consider is AI on one hand has been creating these futuristic realities where we have suddenly voice assistants who can start to understand the things that we're saying and respond in real time. We also suddenly have autonomous vehicles that can understand the world around us and take us from one place to another. Now, there has also been a lot of concern with AI displacing workers. However, we have also found that AI has been creating a number of new jobs for workers. A lot of these jobs focus on getting people to complete the tasks that are difficult for the machines to do. So for instance, you might have human workers who are going to be labeling images. Through this labeling of images, the machine learning models are suddenly going to be able to start to understand, oh, this is a, this is a stop sign, this is not a stop sign. Similarly, Human workers might help to transcribe audio. Through this, uh, for instance, Alexa might be able to better understand what someone is saying to it. Similarly, we can also have human workers who might be helping in the labeling of online content. Through the labeling of this online content, uh, for instance, Facebook newsfeed algorithm is not going to show you hate speech or pedophilia. Um, and so we have a lot of human workers who are in the AI pipeline and helping through this to improve our AI. Now, this type of jobs where you have human workers working closely with the AI to improve it has been on the rise. It is expected that by 2027, 60% um, of the US workforce is going to be involved in jobs that involve AI plus the human workers who are working closely to improve it. Given this importance, a lot of research has gone into, let's optimize these workflows so that we can get higher quality labor from the human workers and through this, improve the AI. 
And so we're pretty live, we're pretty much living a very exciting time where we have AI that is creating these futuristic realities with self-driving cars, voice assistants who can respond to almost anything that we're asking. And we're also creating a lot of new jobs. And so we would say, well, you know, AI is good. This is, this is great. We're living in a very exciting time. AI is good. However, some of the things that we do need to recognize is that AI is creating a new global underclass. So my research has also uncovered that a number of the workers who are involved in this AI pipeline are earning less than minimum wage. They have limited opportunities to grow and develop themselves. And so this is why I'm very interested in this notion about, okay, so how do we create this AI for good? So I argue that in order to create AI for good, some of the things that we need to do is on one hand, we need to understand what are the values that the different stakeholders have, not only the customers, but rather look at all of the stakeholders who are involved in the AI pipeline, understand what are their needs, what are their values, and then we can start to create better technology for them. I also argue that we need to connect with social justice frameworks and theories that can help us to better understand the frameworks and the problems that these different stakeholders are facing. And through this, we can start to design better technology for individuals. So in order to understand the, the different values of the stakeholders, I use value-sensitive design. Value-sensitive design provides me with a nice framework where I can go from understanding what are the values, what are the needs of the different stakeholders, create technologies for these different stakeholders, which note that many times the stakeholders can have values that are different from each other that can maybe even create confrontation. Value-sensitive design offers a way in which you can start to create a balance for the different stakeholders, create technology that creates a win-win for all stakeholders, and it also offers you a way through which you can start to design better technology for these different stakeholders. Now, in order to understand what are the problems that these different stakeholders are facing, I connect with social justice uh, theories and frameworks that provide me with mechanisms through which I can better understand the problems that these stakeholders are facing. And particularly for my research, I'm connecting with Nussbaum's partial theory of justice, which argues that when you're thinking about justice and social good, you shouldn't just think about whether or not you're giving people equal amount of resources, but rather questioning what can people do with those resources and what can't they do? By questioning what can't, they, what can't so, some stakeholders not do, you start to untangle the critical problems that they're facing. And so overall, I use my framework in order to start to navigate this space, be able to understand what are the problems and then design this AI for good. In today's talk, I will be presenting uh, some of the systems that we have developed in my research lab following this framework. So let us get started. Uh, we're going to start around what are some of uh, how, we're, how I'm using my framework in order to design this AI for good. So again, I take my framework and part of the issues that I want to do is first understanding what are the different needs and problems that the stakeholders do uh, face. In order to start to identify these problems, I first uh, conduct interviews and surveys uh, to start to understand what are the experiences of the different stakeholders. Now, I also want to understand quantitatively what is happening to the different stakeholders, to the workers, to the customers, to the employers that are within these digital labor markets. A problem, however, is that a number of these digital labor markets are black boxes. So this means that we have no idea, for instance, what is going on uh, with the workers uh, and how, the, the, how they are being treated. They can start to share some of their experiences through interviews, but it might also be, for, you could argue that, well, maybe the interview data that you get could be tainted, that might be biased. Um, and so I really wanted to be able to quantify what exactly is happening inside these digital labor markets. And so for this purpose, uh, we, my research lab has been creating tools through which we can go under the hood and start to understand what is happening inside these digital labor markets. I'm actually one of my students is, is here um, and we have been developing a number of tools through which, oh, let me play this video. I don't know if it's playing. Oh, um, one second. So let me just play this video. Um, 
Okay, here's the mouse. Sorry about that. So, okay, so we have been developing tools through which we can start to understand what is happening inside digital labor markets. This is an example of a digital labor market that is tied with our AI. Uh, here we have a number of tasks that crowd workers would be doing. What we did is that we designed web plugins through which we can start to quantify, for instance, how much time do these digital labor, these workers spend in completing different tasks? For instance, how much time do they spend searching for work? How much time do they spend uh, completing different tasks? Um, and also how much are they earning for the different activities that they're doing? And so through this, we started to detect that workers and quantify that a majority of the workers on this platform of Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is feeding into um, the AI that Amazon is, is building are earning less than minimum wage. Um, and so this was a, a very nice way through which we could start to quantify what is taking place inside these digital labor markets. Um, what we do is that we give our tools to workers and uh, they install our tool and we're tracking uh, the amount of time that they're spending doing different activities. We have activity recognition algorithms and we start to quantify uh, their their activities and how much they're earning. And within our research, we argue that it's critical that we offer ways through which we can empower more people to have their own data about the activities that they're doing, because if not, it's only large technology companies who have that data and, for instance, might decide they're not going to do anything uh, about the fact that a majority of their workers are earning less than minimum wage. Go to next slide. Okay, so through this research, uh, some of the things that uh, my research lab uncovered was that workers, of course, value having fair wages. However, a majority are earning less than minimum wage. They also have limited opportunities to grow and develop themselves. However, we also found that there are something that is called super workers, which are workers that are earning high wages. They're making a good living on these platforms. They've been on these platforms for a number of years. And so, we took inspiration about from these workers that have been able to make it to start to develop tools uh, through which we could empower all workers to someday hopefully become that type of super worker. So we started to think about, okay, so how do we design AI for these invisible workers? So considering that we found that some workers were able to make it, we connect with those workers and we then tell them, okay, you know what, please share with us what are the strategies that you have for reaching those high wages, for really making a good living on, on, on these platforms. What are some of the strategies that you have um, and uh, strategies also that you feel comfortable sharing with others because uh, you have to consider that maybe they don't want to share given that it might put them, uh, they, it might put their position in, in jeopardy. And so we asked them, what strategies would you be, feel comfortable sharing with other workers? And so uh, we created computational mechanisms through which they could share their strategies. And then we fed those strategies to novice workers to help them uh, start to earn higher wages, start to develop their skills. And now you could say, well, where's the AI in this? Uh, do you even need AI for, for these types of things? We argue that we do because not all of the strategies might help uh, novice workers. There might be certain gems that get lost in the muck. And so here we're designing a reinforcement learning algorithm that we have the list of strategies and our reinforcement learning algorithm starts to learn what are the strategies that the novice workers find that are the best. Here the novice workers provide feedback in the forms of thumbs up, thumbs down for the strategies that are given to them and our reinforcement learning algorithm starts to find which strategies are the ones that are working the best, especially for the novice workers because not all of the strategies might work for them. Now, once we had our AI model, there are different ways in which we could start to implement our new AI. One way is let's create a whole new digital labor market. And in the back end, we're going to create our algorithms. And through this, we're going to give recommendations. Um, I started actually to explore this with Stanford's HCI group, where we built a whole new digital marketplace called Demo. Um, and our goal was to create a digital marketplace that was fair for the workers, especially. However, some of the things that uh, we quickly found was that many times when you're creating a new digital marketplace, recruiting, especially employers, to join your marketplace and actually give good jobs for the workers is extremely time consuming. As a result, you might never even be able to really test out the algorithms that you had set off to create. 
And so therefore I decided that, you know what, we're not going to create new digital marketplaces. What we're going to do is that we're going to work within existing digital marketplaces, but we're going to repurpose them. How are we going to repurpose them? We're going to use this through our web plugins. Our web plugins are going to be able to operate within existing digital labor markets, and they're going to create new types of experiences for the workers within these digital labor markets. So we create web plugins, and the web plugins are the ones that have our AI and are the ones that are providing the recommendations. This way, we do not have to get any buy-in from the digital labor markets about creating change for the workers. They might not even care about them, but we're able to start to help workers, for instance, to be able to uh, follow new types of strategies. And so this is an example of a digital labor market where workers, for instance, they might be transcribing uh, letters. And uh, through this, they could help, for instance, blind people be able to uh, know what, what is being said in their letter. Um, what we did was that we created a web plugin. This is an example of our web plugin. Here, workers can, for instance, share their strategies. And here, they can also see strategies that other workers have given them. And they just provide a thumbs up, thumbs down about how useful the strategy was. Notice that we also focused on providing advice through that other workers could, could give each other in short snippets. Uh, why short snippets? Because this is an activity, this is a secondary activity for the expert workers. Um, you could argue that the expert workers might not even have the time to coach or help the other workers. And so we made it very easy for them to start to create a change within the digital marketplace. Next, we wanted to study, okay, does our tools work? Um, are, are our tools useful for guiding workers to develop their skills, start to increase their wages? Um, also, we want to know, well, how, how is it used in the wild? And so I, uh, we ran a real world deployment with our tools um, where we had workers in three different conditions using uh, our tool, which had the AI, one where they just had the human coaching, and then we had also the control condition. Um, and so the, the, uh, the bar plots, on one hand, uh, the one on the on the further right shows the accuracy, how well were the workers in completing the task. And then uh, the other one shows the amount of time that it took them to complete the tasks. Um, and the bars are color coded based on the condition. What we started to find was that workers in uh, our AI based coaching were the ones that were able to start to complete the task in shorter amount of time and also with a higher accuracy. And so through this, uh, if you measure skill development in terms of how well do workers um, reduce the amount of time that it takes them to complete a task and do a task in, in a good form, uh, we, we argue that we were helping workers to start to develop their skills. Uh, we ran a similar study, but now with two conditions. Uh, one control where workers were not receiving any type of advice, and then with our um, AI-based uh, coaching, um, and we found that we were able to increase the, the wages of, of the group that was able to um, use our tools. Notice that uh, here, this is the hourly wage that workers were able to receive. The hourly wage was still significantly low. Um, so, for instance, in the case of novice workers, it, it, it didn't even make um, over $4, uh, the, the, the hourly wage. Um, there's still a lot that we need to do in this space. Uh, one big issue of these digital labor markets is the onboarding process. And so uh, right now, part of what we're, we're, we're working on is thinking about uh, how do we create uh, more fairer labor conditions, especially for these novice workers, because there's a significant amount of time that they have to spend uh, where they're not receiving uh, good wages. And here it's uh, we're, we're here we're creating more interventions directly with the companies and also other institutions that can that want to give certain training to the workers. So it's not all technology uh, based, but rather thinking about certain interventions uh, that we can provide to to the workers. Um, and so, um, and I think that there's a lot of different opportunities in within this space. Uh, for instance, here we focused a lot on content. Uh, knowledge-based workers. We're interested also in exploring it for other types of platforms. For instance, you could think about something uh, like this for Uber drivers um, or delivery workers. Also thinking about uh, integrating culture into the design of, of these tools, given that you have uh, global workers who are using it. Um, I'm now going to briefly present about how we're using the same framework to start to design AI for good within other contexts. So I take my framework, um, and again, I use it to understand the needs of the different stakeholders. 
And uh, one project that uh, we have been uh, working on, and for this we received an, a large NSF grant, um, and we were also recently recognized by UNESCO as producing one of the most impactful AI uh, research projects, was we took our tools and now we're helping rural workers to develop their digital skills um, and access better jobs. Uh, here, um, one of the things that we did was that we're teaming up with public libraries. So this is a, a map of West Virginia. Um, and West Virginia has uh, certain counties that are highly distressed. Um, and those are, for instance, indicated in red. Each of the points on the map is, that, that shows a star, a blue star, those are public libraries. So even places with highly dis distressed economically, they had a public library. And so what we're doing is that we're bringing in workers into the, we're using the public libraries as spaces where workers, rural workers can start to develop their skills and access better jobs. Um, as I mentioned here, it's working closely with the rural regions that can provide uh, certain opportunities for the workers to start to develop their skills and be able to make a good living on these platforms. And so we argue in our research that it's not just about technology, but it's also about thinking of these social technical interventions. Um, similarly, uh, my research lab has also been doing work around developing technologies for rural regions in Latin America, particularly Mexico. Um, so here again, what we did was that we interviewed um, and had a long stays in rural villages in Mexico. And some of the things that we found was that usually these rural villages were led by women because the men left uh, for the cities to find work. And so the women usually were, were the main uh, holders of, of the home. Um, and we wanted to create technology for them that they would use longer term. Uh, particularly here, we started to explore uh, efficient stoves uh, because many times it, it was a health hazard. Uh, the fact that they didn't um, that, that they didn't have access to good stoves, um, and so some of the things that we did with our stoves was, and again based on the framework about understanding the different needs of 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 people, we found uh, we created technology that the women themselves could modify, um, and so. In order to do that, uh, we turned the technology into, into uh, something that was made out of clay. By making it out of clay, this way the women themselves are able to modify directly the technology without having to be very strong. Um, clay becomes something that is easily, uh, it's, it's something that they can easily maneuver. Additionally, we also found that a way in which we could engage, further engage, uh, for instance, um, the women to use the stoves long term was to turn the whole activity about building and putting in the stove as a participatory activity. And so the here, for instance, the whole village comes together to build a stove for a woman. And what happens is that because it turned into a participatory activity, suddenly um, all of the, the the woman starts to use the stove longer term because it's kind of a commitment between her and her town. Like, oh, I, I, I built, um, my whole town helped me to build this. So I'm now going to be using it longer term. Um, and so part of our research is really looking into ways in which we can understand the needs and values of the different stakeholders and start to design technology for them. Uh, the technology here that we built also connects with their traditions, their tra the, the type of traditional food that they built. And so we, uh, they, they have a large, for instance, certain types of plates. Um, and here we're tying it again with all of the values that they have. Um, now I'm going to present another research that we did uh, here for Mexico City's government. And uh, Mexico City's government has uh, a, its uh, its Ministry of Women has call centers that are focused on providing support for victims of domestic violence. Um, now, the victims of domestic violence, uh, they are uh, many times they need legal advice and they need also psychological advice. And so Mexico's Ministry of uh, Women is providing that type of support. However, through our interviews, we found that an issue was that the government workers had a hard time providing follow-up. So they might meet the women, but they might have a hard, a hard time uh, providing long-term assistance to the women that came to visit them. Um, and also an issue was that the government worker also many times was exposed to extreme violence um, through the interviews that they were, uh, the, through, through, through the interviews that, that they, in, in which they engaged for helping the, the women of, of domestic violence. For instance, some women were uh, many times even in danger of uh, being murdered. And so the government workers started to experience extreme uh, psychological distress. 
And so what we did was that we started to build intelligent um, dashboards. And this was work also that was done in collaboration with the United Nations Accelerator Lab and Mexico City's government. Um, and so our intelligent visualizations, what they do is that they help the, the women, um, the, the, the government employee to provide better follow-up to the victims of domestic violence. Um, and also we had to focus on a dashboard that was easily readable for uh, these government employees who might not have a, a strong technical background. And we also provided uh, assistants who provided um, support, psychological support, and also crowdsourcing support for helping them to connect with humans who can help the government employee in those cases of distress. Um, and so overall, uh, in our research, my, I, I argue that we need to understand what are the values of the, the different stakeholders. And we also need, it's important to connect with these social justice theories that can help us to better understand what are the problems that they face. And through this, we can create better technological solutions uh, that is more focused on AI for good. Um, and so uh, that's that's overall for, for my talk. Um, thank you again very much for, for coming. Um, also, thank you to Ricardo for, for, for inviting me. It was great uh, to, to be here. Thank you. And here's my, my information. All right, let me start with uh, any questions from the room before we go online. Amit? Oh, here's the mic. Thanks so much. Uh, very, very interesting uh, content. Uh, I just wanted to see, you know, there are obviously very large employers of uh, digital, uh, you know, human workers. So what is their attitude, involvement, reaction, and potential role in making some of these changes that you're talking about? Yes. Um, so... We've worked with different actors. So the question is around um, what role do these different employers have um, and how are they reacting as well to, to our tools? Um, I would argue that there are two main types of employers. On one hand, you have the platforms uh, where employers and workers exist. Uh, the platforms, uh, some of them have been a little bit more open uh, and helpful for, for our research. Uh, for instance, we're right now working with another crowdsourcing platform called Taloka. Um, where their researchers are also very much interested in this space about empowering workers. And so uh, they're, they're right now uh, very open to creating changes within the platform based on some of the findings of our, of our research that we have. Um, others are a, a little bit less friendly around, um, also due to, uh, for, for instance, Amazon, what, what they argued was that uh, their platform of Amazon Mechanical Turk wasn't as profitable for them. And so they, they weren't interest, as interested in creating changes. Uh, just because it wasn't something that uh, that that they felt was uh, was was as useful that that was how, that was their their attitude that that was what they said, um, and the employers I think that the the employers that are on these digital platforms, I think that the issue is that many times they're unaware about the problems that exist on the platforms. Um, so for instance, they might not even have realized that a number of workers are earning less than minimum wage or that maybe they should consider that for novices, the whole onboarding process is something that for which they're not being paid. Um, and so I think that part of it is providing ways through which the stakeholders, the, the employers can better understand the problem so that they can take action. Um, and I think also providing incentives for them for change. For instance, you could argue that uh, by creating better pay for, 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 for the workers, um, you might get higher quality work. And so by understanding what are the motivations of the employers, um, may, the, you could uh, create better treatment for the workers. Um, Thank you. We have another question in the room, but before that, I'll ask my question. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you did the comparisons against kind of, well, you, can, you can't even make minimum wage. If these workers happen to be overseas, are you kind of normalizing it for the overseas norm or minimum wage? And then the second question I would have is, would these platforms and or employers basically argue, look, you, nobody's forced to do the work. Uh, it's probably better than zero for anybody who wants to do it. So we're, we're providing opportunity. Just curious what, what the answers yeah. to those are. 
Um, so here we compared with the U.S. Uh, minimum wage um, and a number of the workers, we did the, these studies on, that's a great question. So we did the, these studies on Amazon Mechanical Turk, where a majority were U.S.-based workers. Um, on other platforms, we found similar type of wages where you do have international uh, workers. We found that workers outside the U.S. in general have usually earn less than minimum wage, the, less than the U.S. workers. Um, part of it is, and here the new research that we're doing is creating culturally aware interfaces for workers, uh, because we argue that a number of platforms are tailored for U.S. workers, and so workers outside the U.S. work differently than uh, the, the U.S. workers, but they're penalized, for, the interfaces penalize them for having other work patterns. Um, and so part of our research is interested in creating culturally aware interfaces. Um, and I think it's complicated to think about what would be a fair, what would be fair wages, uh, because you could argue that it's the same amount of work. Um, given that it's the same amount of work, should you be paying the U.S. workers uh, much more than 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 workers outside the U.S.? Uh, that could also lead to cases where all of the work is suddenly outshored, and so it's it's complicated um but i i'm i'm very interested in, in in that area just thinking about it more what how what what does fairness mean in, in that case thank you for the great question uh my question is very similar um so in your research where where are the majority of the invisible workers and if they are in other countries uh how is the um their access the digital ecosystems and to internet accessibility and things like that. How is that affecting their interaction with these platforms? Because obviously there are some parts of the world where internet connectivity is not, in theory, as good as in the US or in developed countries. Yeah, that's a, that's also a very interesting question. So with an Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, I would argue that a great portion is uh, US based. Um, and this is a decision that Amazon made because a, a lot of the work that the workers are doing involves labeling, for instance, of English content. Um, and so they argue that the US workers will just be better because it's their native, it, it's their native, um, it's their native language. And so, for instance, on Amazon Mechanical Turk, if you are outside the US, it's very hard to get on that platform. Uh, we did a study comparing how urban, rural, and super rural workers in the United States uh how they worked on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, Amazon Mechanical Turk becomes very profitable for super rural workers, precisely because uh, since their their form of living is much lower, it's a great opportunity for the the, the wages that they earn allow them to be full time workers on the platform. Um, it also uh, provides jobs that, uh, as you mentioned, that wouldn't exist in their in their region. Um, for instance, a lot of workers expressed that they preferred. Amazon Mechanical Turk than uh, their other typical job, which was Walmart, because uh, they didn't have to drive anywhere. Uh, they could stay at home um, and they could save that money on, on gas. And so that was very interesting. Right now, we're doing a study on understanding the type of workers that exist uh, on in Latin America on these platforms. Um, and we're comparing it men versus women. Uh, an interesting thing that we're finding is um, the workers from Latin America, a lot of them are on that platform Toloca that, that I mentioned. Um, Amazon Mechanical Turk is primarily, you. It's, it's very much focused on the United States. Toloca is much more open to these global workers. Um, and there we found a number of workers from Latin America. Uh, interestingly, we're finding that women uh, from Latin America who are on the platform appear to be from an upper middle class um, uh, based on the surveys that we've, that we've done. And they were primarily single. Um, and so it seems that for, for instance, uh, women who are mothers and might be lower from a lower economic level, there might be certain barriers for joining uh, these types of digital labor markets. Um, and for the women, it was a complementary activity. In the, for the women in Latin America, it was an activity that allowed them to have access to certain luxuries. Uh, so um, for instance, th through this, they could buy certain jewels. Uh, what they expressed in the survey that they could buy certain jewelry. So it was an activity that they were doing to access a higher, a higher class. For the men, it was to um, feed their families. And so this was interesting because usually women uh, use their funds for, 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 for balancing their family. But here in Latin America, we were finding another, another type of dynamic. But this is current research that we're doing. 
Um, and so there's still a lot of questions about who are these invisible workers and having a better understanding of them will allow us to design better tools. Uh, for instance, how do we onboard the women from lower economic um, backgrounds who might not even be right now on these platforms? Um, how do we help the women who are currently on these platforms and they might have other interests, right? For instance, these the, the, the women in Latin America, they were very much interested in uh, getting access to uh, certain types of uh, living li living that, um, that 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 we just weren't, weren't we're not even aware of. And so I think better understanding the visible workers will allow us to design better opportunities for them. I um, mean that's uh, currently what my research lab is is focused on. Um, if all if uh, people are interested, please please join us. Um, we've been part of a, a great apprenticeship program from from Northeastern. Um, and we have a number of undergraduates and master's students who join us to conduct this type of research. And so if you're interested, please shoot me an email. We have a question online from Kim Garrett. Uh, does this model place any responsibility on employers to improve conditions for their workers? Yeah, um, so we have research where uh, what we're doing is that we have focus and actually maybe I, I don't know if it's possible to show it I actually have it here in the background slide um, so some of the research that uh, my lab has also been uh, focused on is thinking about you have um, employers many times can be unfair to workers uh, we argue that part of the problem is that employers might not even realize when they're being unfair to workers. And so we created a system uh, where we're here we're using deep learning to detect when an employer evaluates a worker unfairly, uh, and where unfairness is based on evaluating the worker based on things that were outside the worker's control. Um, for instance, an Uber driver gets stuck in traffic and the employer, in this case, the passenger, writes a horrible review uh, about the uh, about the Uber driver, um, about getting stuck in traffic. And uh, the problem is that that was not at all the fault of the, of the Uber driver. They were likely just even following the algorithm, what, what the algorithm told them. Um, and so what we created was a system that could detect cases where an employer is being unfair to a worker in their evaluations and nudges them, uh, starts to tell them like, hey, maybe you should reconsider what you wrote um, be because it was it, it was potentially unfair. Um, and so our system, and here I'll show you uh, what, what we found, we tested it across different digital labor markets, Uber, Grubhub, and Upwork. Through this, we were able to get employers to start to write uh, fairer reviews for workers. Um, and here I'll show a quick uh, video of, of our tool. Um, and so here, basically, it's um, our system uses. Uh, so here, somebody is writing their 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 review for the for an Uber driver, um, where maybe they got stuck in traffic. And if it detects that they were unfair, it just shows a, a nice prompt for them to reconsider it. Um, and so maybe the, the person realizes, hey, you know what? I think that I was unfair. They might write another type of review. Um, here we're using, uh, we, we train our system with deep learning to learn basically two types of classes, unfair reviews and fair reviews based on the terms of services of each platform. And then based on, the, on that, um, the system starts to learn when somebody is writing an unfair review and in which case it shows a, a simple prompt. Um, and all the time we're working, um, and no, notice that here it's a very simple a AI of a two, a, two, um, a two type of classifier, and, um, and, and it's a way through which we can get employers to reconsider how, how they're treating workers. Um, this is one type of, 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 of work that, um, that, that, that we're doing where we are holding employers uh, more accountable. Um, I think that part of the problem is that employers might not it's it's about educating employers as well uh employers might not be as as aware of um of, of when they're being uh unfair to to workers and so part of our research focuses on uncovering uh when those unfair cases exist but great question because it is imp important to include all of the different stakeholders um i have there was a mention of another question, but I didn't yeah, see it. I didn't see it in the chat, so maybe yeah. maybe it's not updating. Um, but I'll I'll ask my question while we retrieve it. Or or can you say it, Liz? I sure can. <laughs> Minimum wage is just one of the many issues. These platforms are probably not paying taxes, social security, etc. Not clear how to regulate safety. 
It feels a bit like efforts to collect sales taxes on online purchases. You wouldn't expect like, you wouldn't expect Amazon to take sides in the auction. I wonder if there should be another app that is like a union. Workers could collaborate through that other app. They could even do a short 15 minute strike to make more money with surge pricing. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a very interesting and fantastic idea. Uh, currently, we are working on collective action tools for workers. Um, part of it is we argue that in order to enable collective action between workers, you have to, on one hand, unravel what the algorithms are doing to workers. Because an issue that exists is that these the digital labor markets many times also put workers against each other. Uh, they, the algorithms, for instance, on Uber are set to put workers direct uh, to directly compete against each other. And so workers might not even want to unite with each other because the algorithms are creating divisions between them. So what we're arguing for is transparency of the algorithms. Uh, this is why we're collecting the, all the the data from these platforms to help workers see, for instance, how they might be, manip be how they might be manipulated by the by the algorithm, and then help them to start to propose solutions uh, to the problems. Um, and I think also part of it uh, for creating, for, for instance, policy changes is helping policymakers to understand what are the, the conditions of the workers. Um, and this is also why we're collecting the quantitative data to help then policymakers to be able to see like, oh, um, a number of workers are earning less than minimum wage. Um, they're being forced to do a lot of unpaid labor. This is also research that we have been doing around quantifying the amount of unpaid labor that workers are forced to do. Um, and I think that through these data visualizations, it's possible to engage more policymakers. But I, I love the idea of, of uh, facilitating collective action of a researcher, uh, sorry, of workers. Um, currently, one of my PhD students is, is working on this project. And actually, this again relates to the apprenticeship uh, program. Uh, next week, uh, we'll be presenting a research that one of the, the, the graduate students who joined our, our lab uh, did uh, around collective action uh, systems for gig workers. That is, uh, now that I, I, I guess my, sy my system updated. <laughs> um, one, one more question from uh, uh, Juniper. She asks, what do you think we could do for invisible workers who are not being attributed? I'm thinking about something like artists whose work are being used to train apps like Lens.ai, which will bring us into this whole recent GPT <laughs> chat. I have some question on that. So. <laughs> um, I think that maybe part of the solution, so it's also a great question. So I think that part of the solution is unraveling uh, that in the AI that we use, there's a lot of humans involved and there's a lot of labor from humans involved and that labor is not being paid for. Um, and so and there, I think it's important to have a strong uh, narrative uh, and maybe th this, I would argue, it could be related to maybe creating social media campaigns, uh, news articles where you expose that there is a large number of labor that is involved in the, the AI that we're using that is that comes from humans and it's not being paid. Um, the issue with uh, the workers is that they're invisible. And they're very much made invisible so that it, it's easier to, to, have, to have them on very low wages. Um, I think that we need to um, change, ch change that by, by exposing and also facilitating, again, the collective action. For instance, you could argue collective action of uh, the, these content creators um, to be able to unite. Uh, because currently, for instance, if it's only one platform, where uh, they can maybe share their work, the, the platform again also gets to decide, you know what, we, we're going to be using all of your work to feed our AI algorithms and we're not going to give you anything. Um, but if the content creators can unite, they might be able to raise their voice and, and possibly create change. I guess it's, it's a similar issue with, like many companies utilize Wikipedia and no one gets paid other than maybe the, the platform. They get support for the platform, but not, not the contributors. So it's a it's a more universal problem. Um, since there was a mention of uh, Lenza AI and kind of there was also the recent uh, big fuss around generative AI and the news made through the uh, 
new uh, chat API for GPT-3. Um, does this, uh, how, how does this change the picture? Does this make it more complicated? Because now more and more and more of the work that's being done and, and uh, used by humans to help the machines is going to get reduced. Uh, what, what are your, any thoughts on that? And then, you know, do we get to a world where you start to have to pay Lenza, for example, <laughs> for its work? <laughs> So um, I think that when we're designing AI for the, the, the workforce, um, it is thinking about how do we enhance human creativity? Um, so for instance, I, I see uh, these new types of, 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 of generative AI that, 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 that are coming out um, as problematic because a lot of them are not thinking about how do you enhance human creativity? Um, and they lo do look very much as uh, trying to replace human human creativity. Um, I've, I love, for instance, I, I've been using um, some of these, for instance, for rewriting a lot of uh, the work that I do. Um, and I found it extremely useful for being more efficient in my own work. Um, and so I think that uh, we as designers, as computer scientists, we should think about how do we create AI that is not replacing humans, but rather enhancing them um, and also following the values that, that humans might have. Yeah, I mean, my, my characterization so far is it's, it's kind of autocomplete gone, gone yes. awry <laughs> uh, or gone wild. Um, but it does generate, you know, in, in that space of auto-completions, it, it sometimes generates interesting things that may look creative or new. Um, any other questions from the room or online? Any questions online? Anybody in the audience have any further questions? Okay, if not, I uh, thank you again for uh, bringing up all these uh, issues that we hardly think about. Um, and uh, looking forward to uh, figuring out, you know, can you evolve this to something where a, a company who's approaching some AI project can kind of get some concrete advice, what to do, what not to do, how to do it. Any last words on that before I... Yeah, um, I think that's a very important topic. Uh, currently, I'm teaching a course on uh, human-centered AI, and uh, we... We talk exactly ab about that, like thinking about the ethics around around the AI, uh, and I think also an advantage that Northeastern has is that it offers these types of courses. Um, and so I hope that we can engage more as as a community, for instance, and grow. I, I would love to see more courses around th this topic because I, it, it's very important for students as well. I, it gives them also a competitive advantage as they're going into industry because they have the tool set uh, to be able to think deeply about uh, the AI that they're creating in an ethical form. And that's, uh, as you may or may not know, this is a big uh, focus area for the Institute for Experiential AI, which is responsible AI and how do we evolve the right learning curriculum for it. And we're doing it through practicing uh, these things by engaging with companies and helping them out and figuring out, hey, what do we need to teach to exactly. make people ready to do this? Uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much, Saif. It was, uh, I enjoyed the talk. I'm sure everybody else did. I want to thank everybody for attending and uh, happy holidays. Uh, just a quick reminder, we resume our seminar series with the uh, Distinguished Lecture Series starting January 25. Uh, this will be uh, a, a very big deal. I'm hoping that we can bring him on campus, uh, but this is one of the kind of founding figures in the world of uh, deep learning, Jan LeCun. We'll be giving that uh, that lecture on January 25. And then the next expeditions in experiential AI will be in, in February. And we continue the schedule every two weeks after that. So tune in and uh, hope to see you there. And happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, Sai. Thank you. Thank you.